Katie White from the Ting Tings, and you're listening to the Capsule Podcast on liveinlimbo.com. This is Capsule on LiveInLimbo.com. My name is Sean Chin. And I am Andreas Babiolakis. This is an adventure into music, film, and pop culture. The Ting Tings are an indie pop rock duo hailing from Great Britain. They are extremely fun to see live as the musical duo are talented in multiple instruments live and are on tour for their latest album, Supercritical. Today we are joined by Katie White. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm great, thank you. And it's great to have you with us. Thank you. You both sound very serious. Yeah, this is a serious show. <laughs> uh, and it's early morning, too. We just had the coffee and all of that. But, We're uh, going to yeah, cover I for uh, Larry King. <laughs> Um, As I mentioned before, uh, both of you are very, obviously very talented with a wide range of instruments. Um, So while making things exciting for concert goers, do you feel like it's kind of taking a big risk to do on stage live? Um, Yeah, but we always change it up live anyway, even the first album. By the time we kind of toured for six months with with it, it was sounded kind of different from the actual album that we recorded. And we liked that because... We like to add more energy when we're live and change it up. And it, it's a lot more um, raggedy and gritty. It's never, I wouldn't, I wouldn't turn up to one of our shows and expect like a perfect pop show. We're really bad at that. We're really good at just, you know, playing something and then changing it the next show and then trying something different. And that's what we're doing on this third album. We're, um, it's kind of quite smooth when you listen to the album. We wanted that sound. We wanted it on like, analog tape and really airy and smooth. But live has somehow made it much more kind of punk or aggressive. We all seem to kind of lean towards making that kind of performance. Now, it sounds like you have um, a lot of effort that goes into uh, the different sounds and styles that you create. Um, And let's go with uh, your initial sound, the one that broke you out into the masses. And many musicians spend years and years making mistakes and playing with trial and error. How long did it take for um, you both to find this sound that you wanted? Was it something that came right off the bat, or did it take some time? Um, well, both myself and Jules have been in a band before the Ting Tings with another member, and that band didn't really sound too much like the Ting Tings. It sounded a bit like us because it's our songs, but we we definitely um, we moved to a place called Islington Mill in Manchester. So I was like, you know, just turned 21, grew up listening to, you know, mainstream pop music and then suddenly was living in like this, um, it's like a disused cotton mill that had like 50 artists workspaces and we just, we lived there for four or five years and we were surrounded by artists and musicians and people making clothes and ceramicists and that just the coolest music playing. They had like a club that, that there'd be like a band performing every week and I'd see like crazy Japanese alt rock bands and, and I think that definitely had an influence on us. We, I think it was the first time I heard Talking Heads and I got obsessed, and then like Tom Tom Club and Blondie. Um, but what was interesting, I think That's Not My Name was probably about 20 different songs before it became That's Not My Name. We just kept writing and writing and changing and changing until we, we hit on something, really. Yeah, that sounds good. And those are great influences to, uh, to take something from because, uh, well, it clearly shows in your work. It has the energy that those kinds of bands would have, and it has the live presence, as you were saying, you gear yourself towards. Yeah, we, we love playing live. And it work because we're there's two of us normally on stage. And, you know, it's it should be difficult, but in a way, it makes it more easier for, for me to perform because we've tried it where we've had two other musicians on the stage with us, and it totally changed the energy. I think when there's just two of you, you know, you've got to fill that stage and your body naturally makes you move more because you're going, oh my God, you know, there's a load of people here and there's just two of us. And so it really um, adds energy to the performance. It's almost, you know, the things that you're kind of down for actually give you your identity in a way. Absolutely. Now, because there's just the two of you and you have to take up all this space, is a lot of your show improvised or do you um, kind of figure everything out beforehand? 
Uh, we figure it out, but we use loop pedals, so we're we're constantly like capturing our sounds, and then so I'll play guitar, and then I'll catch it on my loop, and then I'll you know hit my bass drum over that, and Jules maybe will start one song on guitar, and then he'll loop that guitar and start to play his drum. So it is kind of we do we do go out, you know, knowing what we're doing, but. I'd say every single show we make mistakes because it's loop pedals. If you play it slightly out of time, suddenly the guitar starts to move out of time and you have to, you know, re-bring it back in and replay it so a section of the song will be longer. But right. again, that, that gives us a, a freedom on stage. We don't play the backing track or, like, time code or anything. We just keep building these samples of what we're playing. And um, I think that's what people feel sometimes, you know. It's, it's two of us, but, there's, you know, we have, like, six different instruments on stage. Yep, there's beauty in the imperfections, so that's all good. Um, so you recently spoke with NME uh, about Manchester's legendary music scene, and you mentioned that before, but can you tell our Canadian listeners a little more about some of your favorite things about it, like such as what are the coolest venues there? Well, f- um, well we've been touring quite a lot now since that first album when we were solely based in Manchester. We went to Berlin for the second album and we beat it for the third one. But for, for us, Islington Mill in Manchester is an amazing place. It's you know, it's you go there and you watch bands that you wouldn't be able to see anywhere else that, you know, wouldn't necessarily get booked because they may be a bit too alternative or you see, you know, performance art, everything. And for me, that was a real life-changing moment when I went there because, you know, I, I literally changed the way I dressed within like a month. So I was like, oh my God, you know, I feel like me and I feel like I can experiment and be artistic. And so it's income was amazing. Um, the Northern Quarter in Manchester, which was like in the centre, um, it's a little bit more of like an artsy kind of place where there's really cool record stores and things like that. And, you know, boutique clothes shops where you're just buying one-off things from new designers, all those kind of things. And then you've got, um, oh God, you've got the Night and Day Cafe, which, you know, has great kind of up-and-coming new bands coming through. It's a, For us, Manchester was a really good place because, you know, as a band, when you're starting out, you can get really lost. If you're in like a huge city like London, you're just one of hundreds and hundreds of bands trying to get, you know, seen and heard. And in Manchester, there's it's quite a small community. And, you know, the second you make a song that's kind of good, you know, all the local radio DJs will play it. And, and it does kind of um, extend out. And the, the, the word does get back to London. And then they all come running down to kind of see the hot new band. But I think that would be much more difficult to do in, say, a New York or a London. Are there any bands right now that we should be checking out? Up and coming ones. What for Manchester? Yes, from I Manchester. don't know any up and coming Manchester bands at the moment. No, I've not been there. I've literally been in a beef for a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, now you talk about all of these uh, inspo- influences and inspirations, all of these venues and um, and sources where you uh, where you find ideas. Now, uh, what about Jules? How do you complement each other? Like, how do you Right with one another. How do you bounce ideas with each other? How does that work? Um, we're quite different. I think that probably helps. Like Jules is a real perfectionist. He will go like spend two years making one song and it's still not good enough, you know. And he he goes and goes and goes. And I'm the complete opposite. Where if I wasn't writing with somebody like Jules, I probably would never get anything finished because I go, oh, that sounds good. Let's just put it out. And he's like, but we've not even written the chorus yet. I'm saying, yeah, but it makes me dance. And and so I think. You know, having someone that's a perfectionist, which, you know, goes a long way in music. If you look at all, like, the, you know, amazing producers and songwriters, a lot of them are perfectionists, but then a lot of them are quite instinctive as well, where, you know, I can just write an idea and I don't really understand how I've got to that idea, but Jules is really impressed. He's like, how did you come up with that lyric? Where did you pull it from? He couldn't, you know, and we just bounce like that. Um, I mean, I, I love writing with Jules. I really do. I can't imagine writing with anybody else really because we're so, you know it's been 10 years that we've been writing songs together now yep. and i feel like we're still doing some of our best work so yeah it's a good team i think where do you go for inspiration like you personally oh um well it's different for each album we, we've definitely somehow got into the routine of moving countries and i think it's not it's not necessarily where you move to, that definitely does influence it. But I think it's, we're almost addicted to feeling like a new band. 
I remember on our first album, our manager, when we would moan that we were tired, he would say, oh, but you need to remember this moment because you can never be a new band again. You know, because you're naive and you're not worried what people are thinking. You're just writing songs that you love. And I think for the second and third album, we always wanted to feel even just 10% carefree, like we were starting again, like we were anonymous, like there was no expectations. And so I think moving countries, like going to Berlin and then going to Ibiza, almost does that for us. And, you know, we, we leave our family and our friends and we start our lives again. And, you know, we meet new people and you start listening to different music because you're in a new kind of crowd. And I think all that definitely helps. I think it's almost like we don't know what is going to happen when we move to a country, but we know it's going to create a situation which is normally good for writing songs. Absolutely. Um, now, is it too early to ask if there's anything done on a follow-up album? <laughs> Um, well, yeah, we, we are writing at the moment, just really rough ideas on iPads and stuff, because I wanted to get some stuff down before we start touring again, because, you know, we come out to the States in, in a couple of weeks' time, and then we're touring again for at least another six or seven months, going, you know, Australia and Japan and kind of all the different countries. But we've already got in our head, I mean, it will probably change, because we, we seem to change our minds quite a lot, but at the moment we're thinking maybe going to somewhere like Nashville, and with, with songs that we've already written and recording the album there. Just cool. because we've never made a record in the States before. I mean, we love New York. It's either got to be New York or Nashville. Um, and we kind of got quite fascinated with country music. Not like full of country music, maybe like a little bit kind of folky. I got obsessive sleep with Mark on, on this album and Stevie Nicks. And we was like, oh, can you imagine if we write some songs on the road and then head to Nashville? and then stalk Lindsay Buckingham and demand that he kind of produces and helps with our album. So that's the plan at the moment. Cool. That's a very good plan. And I mean, who knows, Nashville, that could change your music entirely. Are you, uh, are you yeah, prepared exactly. for such a dr drastic shift? Yeah, because for us, it's so interesting. Uh, we're a weird band because we, you know, we, we write songs and, you know, we love pop music, but we never understand why people would, would want us to make the same album. You know, if somebody say, well, why don't you make an album like the first album? We're, we're, we're kind of like, but we made that album. There's no satisfaction in making an album the same. Exactly. Just for kind of sales figures. We just like kind of experimenting. And, you know, every couple of years we hit on gold. And then for a year we might do something a bit odd that nobody really understands. But then you hit on gold again. You kind of need to go through those processes to, to find the gold. Absolutely. And... Um... With you going to Nashville, do you suspect that there might be a change in instrumentation or um, like what kind of instruments are used? Like a banjo many... or something. Oh, no, not a banjo <laughs> per se, unless that is your idea. <laughs> but... um, we have no idea yet. I mean, we have just kind of set it in our sights. I can say we may end up going, you know, to LA at some point on tour and going, oh, we could totally make a record here. But we, I think we got asked recently in an interview a list of our favorite bands and a big percentage of them were American bands. You know, you're talking heads and you're blondie and, you know, the LTD sound system. And, and so we kind of do feel that maybe we should make a record in the States. It would be peculiar not to, I think, if we've been to Berlin and Ibiza as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so uh, your latest album is Super Critical. Uh, it was released in October of 2014. We want all of our listeners to download that on iTunes. Um, so the final track on that album is called Failure. However, it's incredibly yeah. upbeat and catchy. So what led to the creation of this song and how do you deal with failures in your life? <laughs> um, well, I think... The, the song was written, we wrote it in Vita. It was one of the last songs we wrote for the album. And we wrote the melody first. And it was so poppy. Like, and we love pop, but this was like saccharine sugar pop. And we were thinking, how can we possibly turn this song into something that would feel comfortable, you know, performing? And then somehow we just kind of thought of the lyrics of failure, where you're singing a really happy song about being a failure. And we, we like the idea of subverting it. And that's what we did, and it, it made us laugh when we um, when we kind of wrote the lyrics. It was like, typical us. We can't just write a simple pop song. We always have to put something depressing in it or something that shouldn't be there. But for us, that's, you know, that's one of my favorite songs on the album because of that. And my favorite songs that I listen to, like I love, I'm in no way comparing this to this, this is This song's nothing like this, but I love 
songwriting that's almost, you know, it's a beautiful song and you're dancing to it and then it has the most depressing lyrics. I love those kind of songs. That is very Morrissey-like, actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like a Smith song, you can be like, oh my God, this sounds like the most beautiful, uplifting song in the world. And then he's talking about getting hit by a bus and you think, wow, you know, it's amazing. Exactly. And it's like, oh, the song's actually really bad. It's about how he feels like he fe- he fits nowhere except with this person. And in that sense, that he could die with them. That's kind of really depressing. But it's got a yeah. flute and it sounds lovely. <laughs> and when you're on the dance floor, you know, and you're dancing to that song, you know, it, it's something about, I think a lot of, a lot of kind of records at the moment, especially like a lot of the EDM, for me, if they just put a little bit of that emotion into it, it would be so much more uplifting. Because when you're on a dance floor and you're drunk or you're high and you're dancing, if the lyrics were like something really, you know, deep, maybe everybody would just sit down depressed. But for me, it would make it more euphoric. Yeah, because you could find positivity through negativity, as you said, the Smiths <laughs> have shown that. So um, sometimes you need a bit of contrast to get why the music is so happy or why you feel different emotions, right? Yeah, I mean, for instance, that's not my name. We wrote that when we were so depressed, you know, we'd just been dropped by our record label at the time. And that song was a real, you know, I, I feel so down about myself. I feel like I'm totally not memorable. And 99% of people will love That's Not My Name and think it's a, you know, it's a fun, uplifting song. And we're like, oh my God, we, we never understood it because, you know, that song was a depressing song to us. But you, you, it's very difficult to, to gauge and it's fine. People want to dance to it and think it's fun and happy. That's absolutely no problem. But the place that we was in when we wrote it was really not that place. Yeah, and it's it's like perhaps you're fighting to uh, get yourself out there. I mean, if you... Yeah, now that if you look at it, you look at the lyrics for that song, it's it's a battle. And perhaps your battle is someone else's triumph and they see the optimism through yeah. uh, you fighting with the bad, right? Totally, and I just don't think I'm a very optimistic person. So oh, no, you are, you are. <laughs> Somebody else sees the good in it. <laughs> uh, you mentioned briefly before that you, uh, you and Jules doodle and come up with ideas on your iPad. Do you find that you're doing that more than like on paper and pen? Yeah, I mean, there's loads of great apps now on iPad. I, oh, one what do you that, recommend? Which one? Well, there's one called, it's called Music Studio. I don't know if there's loads called Music Studio, but there's a specific one called Music Studio. And for me, because I wasn't trained on guitar and I wasn't trained on keyboard, I've just kind of taught myself. It's, it's really easy because I can kind of, you know, choose what chords I want to, want to put down and then you just press a button and it plays a whole kind of chord progression. And for me, that was really, a, you know, a really good moment whilst learning to write on an iPad because it's, you know, you can put your ideas down. You can even start almost production on what you roughly want the song to sound like. And then, like, I downloaded a really good app the other day, and it was um, Moog, but it was with, no, it was Korg with the Gorillas. So it was like a keyboard, a really famous keyboard, but the Gorillas have kind of put their sounds in it, the kind of thing that they would use. And that was quite fascinating to see what they would use. Cool. That's awesome. I believe that's what they used with their last album, because they haven't released yeah. it in a while. Wasn't it iPad solely, or? Yeah, I think their last album was it, wasn't it? Yep. Uh, so you have some North American tour dates coming up, uh, including one at the Mod Club here in Toronto. Are you excited to embrace your Canadian fans? Yes, of course. We love coming there, but we hear it's going to be absolutely freezing. Yeah, it is kind of cold right now. But <laughs> <laughs> well, how cold is it? Uh, right now, it's like minus 20 Celsius with the wind. Oh, my yeah. God. But it was worse wow. earlier this week, so <laughs> maybe it might disappear. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Actually, though, I don't mind it because we've been in Spain a lot and it's always blue skies. It's really weird because we've had Christmas and it didn't really feel like Christmas because I'm from England and it wasn't cold. And it's in Manchester in the north of England. You know, it's freezing cold. It's maybe snowing or raining and the sky's grey. And that is how I remember Christmas. Actually, it wasn't really well, a Christmas for us either. Pardon? It, was, it wasn't a Christmas for us either. We didn't get too much warm. snow at all, yeah. 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 It Just might have been win. universal, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Katie, thank you for joining us today. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. You can follow the Ting Tings on Twitter, at the Tings. Andreas, where can all of our listeners find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Andreas Babs. And you can find myself on Twitter, at Sean Chin. You can follow this show, 
at Live in Limbo and use the hashtag Capsule Podcast to join in on the conversation. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes. And as always, you can find the show notes at liveinlimbo.com slash capsule. Take care. Have a good one.